Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with District of Lake Country Mayor Blair Ireland. Lake Country is a rapidly growing and changing community with tranquil lakes, green rolling hills, and lush orchards and wineries. Lake Country is a highly desirable destination for visitors and new residents alike. Only minutes from Kelowna and Vernon, Lake Country gives residents access to the urban amenities while enjoying the peace and serenity of small town living. Lake Country receives more than 2,000 hours of sunshine per year, presenting boundless opportunities for year-round recreation. So stay tuned as we'll be right back after a quick break with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Blair Ireland. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Mayor Ireland, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the persona behind the mayor's position a little bit. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on this show. So you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Blair? Um, you know, I, I think that uh, in my career, I worked in and I worked in tourism. I worked in the, the ski business and I spent a lot of time uh looking after uh, high-end clients. You know, everybody who came to our resort who was important or wealthy was mine to look after. And uh, when I retired, I kind of felt like it'd be nice to do something for, you know, something that had a little bit more purpose behind it, I think, I guess is the right word. Um, I hadn't really thought about what that would be even. Um, I just thought, well, if I'm going to do something else and I want to do something else, what would that be? And I kind of got um, roasted out by my neighborhood to run, you know, like so many people do. They had some issues with the community and I, I ran for council and uh, I solidly beat an incumbent and then uh, was in on council for the next eight years and really enjoyed it. Um, you know, the, the ability to contribute to the community and do something for them, you know, that obviously there's the frustrations of government. I'm sure everybody's well aware of the speed of it, you know. <laughs> Forget the tortoise and the hare. This is a tortoise with one leg. But um, yeah, that's <laughs> that's really so, what I wanted to do. So there's Thank a lot to me. unpack there, and we're only not even a minute into the interview. Yeah. Um, had you paid attention to municipal politics prior to entering in 2014? Because that's the first time I can find that you ran for an election was in 2014 as a councillor. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's okay. Correct. So prior to that election, had you even, were you sort of apathetic of what was going on at city hall? Like I would say, and this is Chris Brown painting the broad stroke here that most residents yeah. are, as long as my water turns on and my garbage is picked up, I don't care what's going on at city hall. Were you apathetic prior to getting involved until 2024? Yeah, no, 2014? Uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, by the time I got to make the decision to run, I was pretty well aware of what was going on. <laughs> Cause that was part of the decision process, but um, yeah, I wouldn't say I was super in touch with everything, but I paid attention. I mean, I, you know, I've, in our family, it was always, if you don't vote, then you don't have a right to say anything, right? If you don't, if you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. So, you know, I brought my kids up the very first day they could vote for anything. They were out there voting with us. Um, you know, I still, I still, you know, they're in their mid, mid twenties, I still phone them on voting days and say, you guys voted, didn't you? <laughs> right? Cause you, you can't complain. 
Um, I, I probably didn't know enough about the local situation because I, I lived at a ski hill and I lived in the community. I, I was back and forth a lot. And at that time, we were trying to build community at the resort as well. So that And that was partially my job to help build that community. Has it been so, what yeah. you expect it? So you have now been on a council for two and a half terms, or you were yeah. just recently acclaimed in 2022 as mayor. Uh, looking back on those first uh, 10 years almost in uh, municipal politics, was it what you expected? And looking back, are the issues that you thought you'd be addressing today, the issues that you thought you were going to be addressing when you first decided to put your name on that ballot in 2014? Yeah, you know, I, I didn't know how, how long everything was going to take, right? <laughs> so what do you mean by that? I, I'm sorry, but what do you, like, okay, you, so you, say, you, you kind me, of made an analogy, and I jokingly brushed it aside, but I want to play in that sandbox. Like, is it okay. really slow municipal politics you find, or is it just the speed oh. of what the decisions are being made are really slow? No, it's slow. It's, I'm going to give you an example. This is my first example. So when you start... When I started in this area, you don't get any training, right? You get a little bit of a, you know, this is what you're allowed to do. Here's your computer here. How's it? Here's how it works. There's your seat. Good luck. So you don't know anything. You learn everything from the person you sit next door to. So once you figured it out a little bit, um, my very first notice of motion was to uh, make our community a, a smoke-free community, which wasn't new, right? That 47 other communities in BC had already done that. Um, but we hadn't. So it was like a housekeeping thing that needed to be done. So I made the notice of motion. The meeting comes. Um, the health authority is there. The province is there. Uh, cancer society is there. Everybody's there. They're all supporting it. They're all, they've all got bylaws ready to go. Right. So you have the little debate and, you know, one of the councillors was going to vote against it, but he saw the, the way, which way the wind was blowing. So we passed it easily. It took a year to actually have it in a bylaw. And there couldn't be a no a more no-brainer decision than that. You were you were the first municipal councillor that has told me that the pace of municipal politics is actually slower than what people may think. Because traditionally, when you think of municipal local governance, you make a decision. It impacts people the next day. You hear people sure. from across Canada saying that local governments is the, has the biggest impact on day to day lives. But you're kind of bucking the trend a little bit here and saying it takes a little bit longer than most people would imagine. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, there's a whole process in that kind of process. The province was involved, so when you have something that has to go to senior government, um, you know, I, I think that goes and sits on somebody's desk for five months before they even look at it. So that's problematic, but a lot of the things that we do go and do that for sure. So, you know, sometimes things go quickly, but, you know, I, I have that frustration. If you want to get, you want to get things done, you want to get things done for your community and uh, it's never fast enough. How do you, how do you quantify good things for your community? Because you at the end of the day are one vote on council yeah. And you ha you are leading a council that is trying to make the better you, you were trying to make your community better than you left it off the day before every time you vote right. on an issue every time you vote on a matter what is the process that you go through to make sure that the issues you're voting on are in the best interest of the community as a whole but not impacting people negatively whether it be budgets whether it be service levels whether it be this that or the other is there a quantitative measure that you put into place when you look at individual issues that are presented in front of council? Well, especially what, you know, when they're large budgetary issues like that, we spend a lot of time in public consultation. You know, we, we've had a couple of, of large budget increases because of massive growth, uh, things that you just can't step away from. So the question always becomes, what are our service levels? Are people prepared to, do they want to keep the service levels? Do they want the service levels increased? Or do they want to reduce service levels? Because a zero budget means you're reducing service levels. A budget below CPI means you're reducing service levels. Unless you have some other, you know, incredible source of income, like, you know, I don't know, you got a gold mine under your hockey arena or something. But, you know, reality says that that's the way that it is. So, you know, you, you just really want to keep your ear to the community. Um, 
you, if they're big, impactful decisions, you really want to think it through and make sure that, uh, you know, council has time to think these things through and, and talk to their friends, talk to their neighbors, talk to their people in the community and uh, make sure the staff is bringing us great information, you know, on, on those things as well. You know, what are the unforeseen circumstances? You know, what's that thing that's going to happen that you didn't know, right? That you, unintended consequences are a huge one, right? And, and that's something that, um, you know, that takes a little bit of time to learn when you start off, you know, you make a decision and then nobody asked what those consequences were. And then the consequences are bad or impactful to somebody. So, so how you, do you, you foreshadow those? Different. Because we have we have municipal leaders across Canada who listen to the show on a regular basis, mm -hmm. and un, un, uh, unintended consequences is, is something that we, we've we've touched on this show, but we haven't really dived into it too much. How do you prepare for something you are not sure what's going to be coming because you do not know what the unintended consequence of your actions are going to be until the action is taken and then the consequences start falling into place. Well, you know, it's it's hard to see the future for sure. But, <laughs> you know, if I had that crystal ball, I don't know, you know, you and I would be playing tennis in Mexico someplace. Look at, you've got to do your homework. You've got to do your homework and you've got to ask that question of staff, right? What are the unintended consequences? You're not going to know everything. But if they know that question is coming and they're prepared for that question, then people will be putting their brains to that. And, you know, council needs to do the same. Do you, you really do you, have, do you oh, speak to residents as well? Do you speak to residents? Because oh, you're talking about talking to sure. administration, which is one part of the solution yeah. of making sure those unintended consequences don't come down the uh, the pipeline. But residents also have to have a voice in this matter as well. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, you've got to listen to the whole community, right? The community often doesn't understand those unintended consequences. So you really want to get a hold of that before you vote, before you have that meeting, if you can, if it's a large thing, so that you can take those unintended consequences to the community and say, hey, you know, this all looks really good, but this is what could happen. What's the risk? Are people engaged in the community? Do you, Would you say that when you go out to the community or when the district goes out to the community asking for public feedback, are you getting a good cross-section? And on the flip side of that, when you do get that cross-section, how important is it for you to listen to both sides of the issue? Because I can imagine after almost 10 years in municipal office, you know you're not pleasing 100% of the people in your community with every decision you make, no matter what it is. Even if it, oh, it seems like the most simplest issue, you're not going to please 100 percent of the people so how important is it to listen to all sides and not just the people in your so, sort of social echo chamber oh it's absolutely important to listen to all sides because <laughs> you know i've been in a meeting where we had an issue i can't remember the issue exactly but there was an issue we voted and one of the counselors voted no and didn't say why and that frustrates me right like you need to you need to say why you vote no, right? You could get away with voting yes and not saying, but you can't get away with voting no. So I went up to him after the meeting and I said, well, what? Like you owe it to the rest of council and you owe it to the community to explain why you voted no. And they said, well, I don't know if anybody's paying attention, but this, this, and this. And I said, if you just said that, I would have changed my mind because I didn't think about that. So yeah, it's really important to, to try to listen and, and I mean, that's what I'm saying, talking about staff doing their homework so that you can be presented with all the unintended consequences that you think of, the unintended consequences that they think of. And then, you know, you, you throw those out to everybody and say, okay, these, it's, it's always a risk decision, right? Like, is that unintended consequence really bad? Is the unintended consequence that, that, uh, you know, we lose, we lose a tree. Well, that's bad, but it's not that bad. Um, the unintended consequences we lose 100 trees well that's really bad yeah so uh, yeah it, it's hard and do people are people engaged enough of course not i, I mean we all know that uh you know i, I don't know how you know I, I can't say how it's how much apathy there is i'm sure there's, there's lots of that but what i also see is that people are busy you know people you know house prices in my community this is an expensive place to live and so, you know, the husband and the wife, if that's, you know, if they're that couple with kids, then they're both working and the kids are at school or in daycare. 
you know, they're flying from work to get kids to soccer, volleyball, basketball, go skiing, play hockey, whatever it is. So how much time do they have to engage with us? You know, what we hear a lot from these people is, you know, we voted for you to make decisions. You know, we appreciate you asking the questions. And we have to get better at trying to engage with those people. And we constantly, constantly work on it. You know, we have we have different forums. We, we uh, you know, we have open houses. We're going to try to do more of those. Um, it's really hard to get people involved, though. So, so, so uh, can I ask... That being said, you can't stop doing that, right? You have to continue and try to keep getting people involved. So I, I have a weird question, and I didn't want to talk about this now, but I, I was going to talk about it later on. But last year, the eyes of the country were on in your area when the wildfires of 2023 sort of ripped through Lake yeah. Country, Kelowna, West Kelowna. And I'm going, to, I'm going to try and make sure I ask this correctly. Since that fire, since a natural disaster like that has occurred, do you find more people looking to the municipality for answers about, okay, what's going on this year? We're we're anticipating a drier season across Canada this year compared to years before. Is the is, is the average resident now looking to the municipality saying, okay, what can we do to be prepared so we're not stuck in the same position like we were last year? Oh, a hundred percent. They are. I mean, people are very concerned about that. You know, on one side of things, it it made uh, upgrading fire apparatus a lot easier in the budget, for sure, because uh, we broke a bunch of stuff. You know, it, that and that's a hard thing during the fire. But people are definitely asking about fire mitigation. You know, how we can help them? Why we don't do more? Can we do more? What can we do? You know, we have people in the community talking about um, how we can. You know, perhaps think about changing our building bylaws to include non-flammable material on houses. Um, we're already um, at this point. We're uh, we, I put a notice of motion forward actually in the in November about um, planting, so not planting flammable materials. So no cedar hedges. You know, we're not going to go rip out the ones that exist, but going forward, no more. You know, you're you're actually pointing a loaded gun at your neighbors. So. You know, there was a lot of backlash to that because people thought that we were going to go tear them out. And I'm saying, well, we're not going to tear them out, but you're probably your insurance company is going to make you take them out or probably your neighbors are going to put pressure on you. So you, you need to start thinking about it. But yeah, I mean, people, people, people are nervous. And, you know, right now the drought numbers, uh, it's certainly looking very dry. I mean, I'm sitting here in my office looking out at a sunny day. It's supposed to be 10 degrees today. Uh, it was minus four yesterday or something. It's just up and down like a yo-yo. We're super fortunate in the Okanagan right now that our snowpack is is just uh, just under normal, but that's only in the central Okanagan. You know, the guys up at my my reservoirs up in the lakes there, we were 110 percent last week, which is great for now. But we got to sustain that until beginning of May. So that's the worry. Here's hoping that you can do that. I want to go back to the uh, the communication with the residents for a second here. Before we turn to the district as a whole, I want to ask about the jurisdictional roles that the municipality plays compared to the other levels. Now, you and I both know that the municipality has a certain role that they have to play in the day-to-day -day lives of the everyday people. But right. more and more people are seeing a blurring of that jurisdictional line. I would say, and this is Chris saying this, that yeah. more people are going to municipal leaders because they're the closest to the people on healthcare files, on education files, on wildfires, which is traditionally more of a provincial federal issue, but they are looking towards yeah. the municipality. Would you agree with that sentiment in the district of Lake Country? Oh, 100%. I mean, there, I don't think there's any community in this country that's not feeling downloaded on by their senior governments. There just is not. I mean, they, you know, you say healthcare, uh, I opened up my email box to a bunch of questions about healthcare, which I have no jurisdiction over whatsoever. So how do, you, how do you, how do you tell someone you don't have jurisdictional purview over an issue without sounding like you're brushing them off because they're coming to you for a reason. They're asking yeah. you these questions because when I speak to municipal leaders across Canada, and this bothers me like there's no tomorrow, more and more times than not, 
I'm hearing that municipal leaders have an easier time to pick up the phone and contact their MLA, their MP, a cabinet minister, than the average resident does. Is that probably the case of why people are approaching you as mayor, as the leader of your community, because you're probably willing to get or able to get those answers that they might take two or three months to get? That, that, that could be. You know, I don't know if, if they're that, well, that deep into it. They just they want change is what That's they want. True. That, that right um you know it, it's it's a really hard situation i can yeah i could phone my mla today or phone my mp but neither one of my mla or my mp is in a governing situation in their jurisdiction so i'm not getting anything right really just about zero so it, okay, I mean, that, that's a very, that, 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 that's a that's a very political answer there, there, Blair. And I just want to make sure I, yeah. I heard you correctly. Are you saying right here, right now, that the district of Lake Country does not get anything from both the federal and provincial governments? Well, well, right now, I don't think I can't remember the last time I got a a, a federal grant for anything. It would be um, wow. It would be before the last election. Uh We've gotten a little, you know, we get some things out of the province, you know, nickels and dimes, but we haven't got anything large. No, we haven't. I mean, I can't, I have to be blunt about it. No, and I appreciate and we, it. It's just that is, uh, that's a huge thing to say because I would assume that everyone's being treated fairly, no matter if you're represented by a liberal, a conservative, a United, a BC United, a NDP. It just doesn't seem right that all municipalities aren't being treated the same well one one would hope that that's the case but <laughs> one would hope um i, would, I, wanna, I would put that in quotation marks <laughs> i want to turn to segment two here for a second because i'm cautious of time and i want to yeah. add, preface this question by saying this this is a conversation between the mayor and myself this is not a motion of council this is not a direction of council this is not a policy of council this is the mayor's opinion and his opinion alone it may match up to what the uh, municipality is speaking about but it's in his own words and he is one vote on council like i said earlier Mayor, in your opinion, what do you believe are the biggest issues facing your community today as of recording this episode? Okay, well, <laughs> growth and infrastructure, and they go hand in hand. Um, right now, we're trying to, uh, we've got a plan to put in water filtration. We don't have water filtration in our upper stem lakes. That bill is $85 million. So I'm just writing that down tax, because that, that seems like a lot of money. 1% tax increase in Lake Country is $200,000. So I'm not getting that without senior government money. I'm just not getting it. But we have to keep fighting for that. On the flip side of that, um, BC Stats just released their, house, their projections for population in the next 20 years. And... Uh, and I'm sure you're well aware that the Okanagan is a fast growing region. Well, they picked us to almost double our population in 20 years. So 90% increase. Kelowna's at, you know, 40 to 50 or something like that, but we're at 90. So, you know, that's a massive increase in population and a massive amount of building. And we don't have the infrastructure to support that. And, you know, pipes in the ground, all those kinds of things. You know, upgrades to roads. You know that we haven't seen um, we haven't seen an upgrade to the highway that, that splits our community in I don't know ten years. So we're not getting those big infrastructure pieces. You know, the province of BC they want us to build houses. The federal government wants us to build houses. We're okay with that and trying to fix our processes to get houses built faster and and quicker, but. How am I going to do that if I can't serve them with water, sewer, a way to get there, transit, all those things? And I don't have them. Give me a silver lining here, though. Like, there's got to be some silver lining in this because don't like doubling your population is a quite a substantial feat, no matter what municipal what municipality you are if you're going to have need to double your uh, municipality population or that if that's what they're anticipating your municipality to double i can only imagine that the work cannot start 
20 years from now. It has to start 20 years ago to get to that place. Is the district set up potentially that you will be able to do this? Or is it all coming down to this infrastructure funding that not only you, but every other municipality is facing a infrastructure deficit as well when they're trying to achieve these housing targets that the federal, the provincial governments have been sort of unilaterally put in place? Yeah. Look, at, I, we're going to be able to achieve a lot. You know, we've, we've rejigged some areas. Um, we always had high density zoning in our core where we have services. We haven't been building a lot there. We've been building, you know, we've been building out on the fringes in the past and, you know, homes overviewing the lake that are, are you know, they're large, expensive, and two people live in each home. So, you know, we have to change what we're building and that's happening. You know, I have a project not far from my municipal hall that's going to house about 2,000 people. So we're just going to have to keep working. <laughs> There's just no. Is no there buy in from the community? Our... Sorry? Is there buy in uh, from the community? Because going ahead with these projects is one thing, but if the community does not want to grow, does not want to become this uh, place where the population doubles within the next 20 years, I can imagine it's probably challenging to look at different types of housings, infills, apartments, you name it. But yeah. you know, you have to do it because people want to live in your community. Yeah, there's, there's, Obviously, definitely people who don't want the change. Right? I mean, NIMBYism is alive and well in Lake Country there, Mayor. Is it, isn't it alive everywhere? Uh, I don't think we're special to that. Um, we're very fortunate, though, because a lot of our community, you know, we're 50% of the land in our community is in the ALR. So it's preserved farmland, and it kind of surrounds us and buffers these different neighborhoods. So it gives us a semi-rural feel, and that's not going away because you're not going to be able to use that land to build. So, you know, hopefully we can retain enough of that rural nature that people want. I think, you know, there's lots of people who don't want change, but a lot of that older crowd too is starting to say, hey, my kids can't live here. My grandkids can't live here. You know, how, how do we find a place where they can live? And then they're also saying, well, how come there's no employees at Tim Hortons on the weekend? How come, you know, Starbucks in our community uh, a little while ago would close on a regular basis because they had no employees because they can't afford to live here. So if we're going to have all these services, you know, we're going to need to have services to have that. We're going to they're gonna have to have a place to live. And I think that uh, a lot of people are starting to face that reality of understanding that, you know, the, you're never going to get away from the people that always want it to stay the same. I mean, I think sometimes in our hearts, we always want our home to be the way that it was when we were there. I think that's you, in all of us. Are you stuck between a rock and a hard place right now as a municipality? Because you 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 seem like you want growth. You want to be able to help these businesses find uh, employees, find workers. So, But you also understand that you need housing and housing costs money. And you can't do it fully on the backs of the people who are currently there because they're struggling right now. It seems like yeah. you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. You know what? I, I, I don't think about it like that. I think you, you're probably right. I try to be positive. <laughs> you know, I've got kids. I've got kids in that mid-20s range. You know, they can't afford to live here. So I wake up every day and think about them and their friends and how we can make a positive change so that we can have a whole community because that's what we're striving for. Any community has to have all those different pieces and parts. They have to have single family homes. They have to have affordable places. They have to have nice mid range places, some older places that are fixer uppers. They have to have businesses. They have to have industrial. They have to have all of that. So, yeah, we've got a lot to do. I mean, we have a very limited commercial area. We have no light industrial. We have a plan for that. We're going ahead with that. We're going to drive that because that's going to bring more balance to the taxpayer and, and uh, you know, take that burden down from the, the homeowner. So, yeah, we've got lots going on, but we've got to be positive. We need to make that change. There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> and the province has told us to. <laughs> Let's just face the facts. The guys with the, the guys at the top have said, do it or, you know, so 
you might as well get on board and try to do the right thing. You know, we're fortunate. The province has got their list. You know, they came out with their list of 10 bad guys. And then they had their list of 51, 50 bad guys. And even though we have not built a lot of multifamily residential in the last little while, we are now, but we hadn't. Uh, we've had enough growth that we're not on the top 50 bad guys list in BC. So, you know. Silver lining? <laughs> So silver lining is we got to be positive. That's that's our job. That's my job is to work for the community and, and try to try to make the best of it and get the best for our community. Are developers knocking on your door? Are developers wanting to say we want to build in your community and we want to help you reach this goal that the province, the federal government, you have set? So that way, in twenty years, once you do po- uh, double the population, you will be sustainable, and you're going to be not playing catch up in twenty years to try to accommodate the growth that you're seeing. Yeah, you know, you know, we've got a lot of stuff in the pipe. You know, it's just actually just outside the pipeline. If you want. Right? <laughs> It's just it's ready to come in. Yeah, lots of people are coming. Um, you know, we have some frustrations because we came up against some issues in the, the permitting and planning area where, uh, you know, we, we came up against a staffing issue where at one stage we were down to uh, one temporary planner, and that's all the staff we had. And we were at the beginning of COVID getting the just about two and a half times the normal amount of applications. So we're still digging out from that mess. But... Um, there's lots of people that are going to come and, and, you know, what we're trying to do is, you know, with the help of the province is streamline our processes, you know, get realistic so that we can get the housing built that we need to get and get, you know, the commercial core that we need to get, get the light industrial that we need to get so that, you know, not forgetting, of course, that there's all those other things that make people's lives great, right? Like beaches and trails and hockey and, whatever the else that is pickleball everyone loves their pickleball in 2024 that's all i, guess. <laughs> I haven't done it yet <laughs> well, there you go you let, let when i'm when i come through the uh, lake country next year or later on this year let's go play around to pickleball <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. i'm thinking about it um the, the F the Federation of Canadian Municipalities released a study earlier this I think it was actually earlier this year or beginning late last year where it says that cost the average the were average municipality one hundred seven thousand dollars for infrastructures for one unit of housing one unit of housing cost the average municipality one hundred seven thousand yeah. um, dollars you it sounds like you've been banging your banging every door in Van, or Victoria every door in uh, Ottawa to try and get funding to help offset some of these costs that the municipality is facing i'm asking a political question here yeah if the if the province and the federal government don't come to the table what's your next step and I know you kind of alluded to the fact that you you don't know how you're going to sort of navigate the next few years when you're trying to get to this without money. But what is the next step that the municipality has to take if the federal and the provincial government don't come to the table and help out a municipality like yours who needs the funding to uh, hit these targets that they've so eloquently asked you to ask, well, not ask, but demanded you hit? Yeah. Yeah, that's a tough question. I suppose right now we can get to our provincial targets given that we build in the areas that we need to build in, you know, where, where the infrastructure is. Um, you know, that being said, when we add all the stuff to it, then it's going to be, you know, there's going to be infrastructure upgrades. Infrastructure is not forever. You don't put a pipe in the ground and just walk away for the rest of your life. Um, it's going to be really hard. So, you know, I think we're going to get to our targets. You know, I think I told you earlier that one project alone gets us close to the five-year target in one project. So, you know, and then we've got lots of others that are looking at it. But long-term, if we don't get some funding, then you you wonder if your community is going to be sustainable. You know, you hate to say that. Um, I know that's why we try to make as many contacts and bug every single minister that we can ever get our hands on to talk to, you know, and, and, you know, I'm sure you're aware that FCM put out the call last year that municipalities need stable funding. This grant stuff is ridiculous. 
and we have to fight with our neighboring municipalities to get a grant to do something. And if we don't get the grant, we're not doing it. So how can we plan for that and build it at a build it at the time it needs to be? You know, and, and you know they clearly got that message. We've been ha hammering away. I think municipalities have been hammering away at that for years. But that was what came out of FCM's conference last year. You know, I spoke to the uh, the federal minister of housing, Sean Fraser, at a housing conference in Vancouver a couple months ago because he made some remarks about that. But it was like, you know, the tone that he was taking is it was almost, we're not sure that you're going to spend it properly if we give it to you. And it was, I couldn't, I could, that was said to the conference. So I had to go and talk to him about it because I couldn't just take that line down. I, I remember that comment mm -hmm. because it was the comment that stuck out to me because I think he basically alluded to the fact that he understands that FCM has been, uh, been calling for a new fiscal framework, but he's, he's not a hundred percent sure that the money is going to be spent in an appropriate uh, fashion along the lines that they would want to uh, see the fundings uh, spent. And I'm like, I think municipalities know what they need to be doing with that funding if they get it. Well, Chris, when I give you your allowance today, when you go to the store, okay, I don't want you to buy any red candy. <laughs> okay. Dang. <laughs> Come on. That's, that's, you know, no, no offense to the minister, but a little bit of offense. We don't have the kind of money to waste or the time. We don't have the ability to waste money. We are on the edge all the time. You know, they make us balance our budgets to the penny every year. There's no deficits for us, right? They can do what they like. But we can't afford to do that. You know, if we want to borrow big money, we have to go to the community. And like, you know, when I was talking about my water filtration project, I am not going to the community and asking them to to tax buck up for eighty five million dollars. I'm just not going to do it. Um, we saw how that worked out for a neighboring community for you down in uh, the uh, I, I forget the region that the Soyuz is in, but Soyuz, Soyuz, yeah. Soyuz did that exact same thing, and the municipality was like, "We can't do this." And well, not the municipality, but the yeah. residents sort of were up in arms a little bit. Can I ask the flip side to that first question, though? Because you sure. you talk you talk about two very big macro issues, housing and infrastructure, and they are very macro issues that I'm assuming the municipality are dealing with on a relatively significant basis of their council meetings. But you go talk to people in your community. I talk if I go to your community tomorrow and ask a hundred people that same question, they're not all going to say housing and infrastructure is their biggest issue that they believe is important to the community. Oh. They might say service levels. They might see potholes. They might see parks. This oh, come that on, I can tell you exactly what they're going to say. <laughs> what? Okay. What would? What would they say? In every single community in this country, they're going to say potholes and roads. Exactly. It's always potholes and roads. But and, how do you balance you know, that then? How do you balance oh, yeah. the needs of the community against the needs of the many, because the needs of the few? Because that pothole in front of that John's house or Sarah's house or Beth's house or uh, jo Jonathan's house, they that is the most pressing issue to them because I have to run over that pothole every time I leave my driveway. I have to hit that pothole every time I go out to get groceries, and it bothers me. And it may be yeah. micro in the grand scheme of things when you look at it, but you have to look at that issue and say, okay, how can we help John fix that pothole? Or how can we help Beth fix that, uh, that park bench that is in her area that needs to be upgraded. That she believes is the most pressing issue to her. That's why you have to have balance. You know, at the end of the day, all these things are about balance. So we don't not fix potholes. We have a budget, we have a, a tax that goes to road renewal. Um, you know, we've increased our capacity to be able to deal with potholes and things. Um, there is not a pothole in this community where you're going to wreck your car. And I mean, I, I don't, you know, personally with potholes, I don't think about it, right? It's, it's not what's going to wreck my day bouncing my car a little bit. I mean, and, and it is a little bit. If there's a hole that could hurt my car, I totally get that. But if it's not, you know, and our crew does a pretty good job of trying to keep it together. You know, in our community, one of the problems that we have is that, so we are, just 28 years and 11 months old and when this community came together the province should give you those roads in decent decent shape right they're <laughs> obligated to do that so but what did they do 
there was a change in government. So the community got nothing. And all our roads were constructed as orchard roads. They're not built for cars and truck traffic and all this thing. They were designed for tractors and, you know, hauling the apples to the, to the next orchard sort of thing. So there's a lot to do. So how do we balance that? We have a budget. We have a road plan. We go and attack that every year and deliver what we can deliver every year. Uh, we go and do the same thing with parks. Are it's people willing to accept problem. that answer, though? Are people willing to accept that answer that, unfortunately, you uh, municipalities only have a limited supply of money. We cannot run deficits. We we would love to fix everyone's issues tomorrow, but we just can't because of the fiscal realities that we live in. Are the people of Lake Country willing to accept the fact that the municipalities aren't able to fix everything this year, but it could be a year from now, two years from now, three years from now? Some are, some aren't. <laughs> right? Some people understand reality. Some I love how pessimistic you are about this. Like this, you you oh, seem so I'm honest not... about these answers, and I feel so like off because I'm like I'm not used to hearing like honest answers from a politician. Like it's weird. <laughs> so I would prefer to call myself an elected official. I don't feel that there's any poli political part to this, right? <laughs> I don't have a political <laughs> party. I'm just here trying to do the best I can for the community, and. I am going to be blunt and tell you exactly what I think or what the truth is. So, you know, some people are never going to be happy unless you do their one little thing. You know, some people say, why do I have to pay money for the hockey rink? And I, I, I get that a lot. Okay. So my answer to that is I don't really skate. I ski, my kids skied. I've been in that arena maybe once or twice. My kids went into it for their grad parties when they graduated, but they've never been back. We don't use it at all. But do I support it? 100% I support it. It's a valuable asset to the community. There, hundreds of kids use that facility. Hundreds of families that can't afford to do anything else come up for free DJ skates. So, yeah, not everybody's happy with how money is spent. So you just have to try to get as much across the board as you can. And some people are never going to be happy. I appreciate that. Um, I want to turn to my last segment because I just realized what time it is. And I said 45 sure. minutes and we're almost at the 45 minutes. And I want to talk I about a subject you. that's near and dear to my heart, but I'm pretty yeah. sure it's near and dear to your heart as well, because you talked about it at the beginning of the interview when I asked you about duty to serve. And that is tourism. I think yeah. municipalities need to promote themselves a little bit better. I'm not saying not all of them, but I'm saying that municipalities are often overlooked when it comes to tourism strategies from the provincial or federal government. As someone who is going to be coming through Lake Country later on this year, actually probably in the next two months I'll be coming through Lake Country, what are some of the tourist hidden gems that I should see while I'm there, Mayor? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, there's so many, right? I mean, Coming into Lake Country, if you're coming in from the north, you've got to stop and look at Cal Lake. I mean, Cal Lake is is one of the top most beautiful lakes in the world. It has a it has a calcium mineral level in it that allows it to change colors depending on the temperature. So some days it looks like a tropical beach, other days it's a deeper blue. I mean, it, it's incredibly beautiful. Um, as you come in from the north, you you come into a a small we have different areas in our community. They're all identified as wards. We're the only ward system government in BC. Actually, there's no other. So you come into a little place called Oyama. It's an older, you know, it was an older little town probably in its day. And uh, it sits on an isthmus between Cal Lake and Wood Lake. And you drive across this isthmus. There's, a, you know, there's a store. There's a fantastic uh, big fruit stand there. And, great little pizza place that's embedded in this fruit stand. Um, you know, they, you come through into the main part through Wood Lake. So that's, we're Lake Country because we're surrounded by lakes. We have Cow Lake, Wood Lake, Duck Lake, and Okanagan Lake. So if you come through the community and you decide you want to go to Okanagan Lake, you take a, you take a right, if you're coming from the north, you take a right, go to the west, you go up over the hills and come down to Okanagan Lake. And you come to a little community called Okanagan Center. It's about four or five, maybe six kilometers of public beach. It's a little rocky, but it's beautiful. Um, it's a great place to hang out. There's some docks there for, for playing and that, all that sort of stuff. And you travel through wine country when you do that. 
so you know there's uh, there's numerous wineries on the way uh, you know some really great you know well-known ones like gray monk winery um, intrigue ex nihilo arrow leaf uh there's peak sellers uh in 2025 there will be a very 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 large incredible winery opening in this community uh o'rourke family estates is opening up a yeah, it's it's just an incredible facility. It's um, it's going to rival. Did I read? The did did I read correctly that Lake Country gets over two thousand hours of sunshine every year? I hope so. <laughs> I don't know the answer. The only reason I say that is because I read that on your website. I was like, that seems like okay. an abundance of uh, sun. So it must I, be, it must be true that if it's on the website. Okay, I was just wondering because it just seemed like because it seems like an outdoor paradise for people just to come oh, and enjoy the outdoors. It totally is. I mean, we've got the wine, we've got the lakes. If you want to go to a mountain lake, it's a short drive up to some mountain lakes where there's great fishing, fly fishing. Uh, there's some fast, fantastic hiking trails all around. Um, you know, some nice little hidden gem restaurants that hide around the community. You know, it, it's a great place. It really is. I mean, the other the other thing that it may not be, it's becoming less and less hidden all the time is the rail trail. You know, us in Kelowna and the North Oregon Regional District, we purchased the old CN right-of-way and we've uh, restored the bed on it and it's open for cycling. So you can cycle from one end of Lake Country all the way to Vernon very comfortably. Uh, if you, there's numerous places to rent e-bikes if that's the case, if you, you know, you want to have a little easier, and I can tell you the e-bike's a good idea because <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice little route to get on that bike, ride to Vernon. You know, there's a nice lakefront little place down the road there, and you can ride there and come back. And I mean, riding along Cal Lake is sensational. So where do you go? Where do you go after a stressful day of meetings, after a long day of council meeting, budget deliberations, uh, meeting with council, uh, meeting with MLAs, MPs? Is there a place in the community that you can go and just escape it all? Just re recenter yourself, refocus yourself, because you know tomorrow morning you're going to have to be back and doing the exact same thing, trying to make your community a better place? Well, there's two, because in the winter, it's a ski hill. Right. I mean, we're also one of the great things about Lake Country is we're equidistant, really, between Big White and Silver Star. So you can get up in the morning, look at the webcams and decide where you want to go and which is which has got better weather. So in the winter, um, we go up skiing most every weekend. In the summer, it's on the lake. It's on, you know, mostly on Okanagan Lake because I live close to that. But um, any of the lakes, you know, paddling a canoe, like a paddle board, a little bit of sailing, water skiing. I mean, it's pretty rough here. I mean, you're forced to do all this water sport. And... So I'm going to ask the million dollar final question. We started by talking about yourself. We're ending by talking about the district. And I've got to know, what makes the district of Lake Country such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, I mean, what we were just talking about is one of those things. You know, with this great natural environment with surrounded by lakes, surrounded by ALR land, which gives you that nice rural feel. Um, we have very low crime. You know, I have extremely low crime rate. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of homeless people at this, this point in time. Uh, we don't have the services for that. Uh, it's a it's a safe place to be. There's lots to do. You know, we we try to, uh, as a community, program a lot of things for people to do. You know, we have very extensive recreation programs. Uh, in the summer, if you're here in the summer, every weekend for the, the core of summer, we have large outdoor community concerts that are free. And we bring in some pretty good bands, you know, obviously not, uh, not the ones you saw in the Grammys, but although we did have a Grammy winner at our theater the other night. But yeah, we have these large outdoor concerts. We get two or 3,000 people out. We really work on the, the core of this community is incredible. You know, and you, you see it at certain times. You don't always see it, but it really is. When something happens, this is a great community. And the identity that it has, it's different than Kelowna. 
mean, Kelowna might just be too big to have that now. I don't know. But when the fires happened, I mean, you saw it in spades. You know, there's this one little story I'll tell you quickly, and I talk too much, I know. But better so than I talk live... a lot than not talk at all, Mayor, because if <laughs> you didn't talk, it would be a very bad interview, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so during the fires, I live right on the border of the evacuation zone. And uh, so if I'm on the other side of the street, I'm evacuated. So, but I'm not. So every day there during the fires, there was police at the corner stopping people from going down to where people from evacuated to protect their properties and stuff. And, uh, you know, there's so little that you can do as, as somebody in the community sometimes, right? <laughs> like you try to do everything you can and get involved in everything you can, but it seems all so little. So, you know, I spent a lot of my time thanking people for what they were doing. So every time there was a shift change at that police thing, I went out there and said, hey, you know, thanks for doing what you're doing. Really appreciate that. You know, where are you from? Because you were from all over the province, you know. I was dealing with this this one, uh, this guy and girl came in a van, black van. I don't know what van was. I'd never seen one before. And I asked them where were they were from. And they were from, you know, they're a tactical squad out of Surrey. And it was so fantastic to see all these people from all these different places. But on one night, the shift changed. So that girl and guy, actually, they were there in their van. And then this big suburban pulled up. Or, well, it's an explorer, I guess it is. And there was like five guys in it. And that guy in the back, his hand was bigger than my head. And uh, we were just having a great conversation. And all of a sudden, I live at the bottom of a very steep hill. And this there's this music coming down the hill. And it was kind of weird because it was dusk. And it's an ice cream truck. And it seemed like something out of a horror movie at the time. It was like, what the hell is going on here? And it comes down to the bottom and this guy jumps out of it. This guy rented that truck, bought all the ice cream, and he was having them drive it up and down and giving free ice cream to everybody he could find. And he's a he's a carpenter, a plumber in our community. It's just such a great story. I mean, just trying to do what he could do, the little part that he could do. It seems like a very community community. Like everyone pitches in when things are tough and everyone's willing to go above and beyond when the when the community's back is against the ropes. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're trying to keep that. We're, we're, we, it's, we struggle with growth. It's not easy to do. But, you know, the kind of programming that we do, you know, these free concerts, they're... they're you know, the turnout is massive and people love it. And, you know, we're giving people something free, you know, sure. There's taxation involved and everything, but you know, those families and everything that have to buck up for everything that they do, you know, soccer, hockey, whatever it is, here's something they can go and do on Friday night and not buck up right then and there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just foster and keep fostering that community feel. Blair, I want to thank you. This has been a great way to start a great week for myself, uh, for interviews. Uh, you seem so honest and sincere, and I'm not used to that, uh, talking to sure. an ele Sorry. <laughs> elected official. No, and I, I, I hope people who are listening to this, whether it be uh, the people in Ottawa who regularly tune into my show, because I know, because they always send me emails right after something gets said despairingly about a minister. So for yeah. those who are meant to send me a message about Minister Sean Fraser, he can come on the show and we can talk about these issues that we just talked about. Or if um, anyone who is hearing this, who is an elected official, take a page out of Blair's book and just tell it like it is because you get further in life doing that. Um, Blair, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me today. Oh, no, I had fun. And, and just about Sean Fraser, because he said what he said and you knew, you know what he said. So I went up and talked to him about that. So I'm not going to speak disparaging about him because he took the time to talk to me. We had a good conversation about it. So, you know what? I, I, like you want to criticize a lot sometimes, but again, you've got to do the work and be part of the solution, not part of the problem. <laughs> now, today's episode sparked your interest. Hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations like today's on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. 
We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few months. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.